you quite clearly don't understand the huge peril in which you find yourselves. It's no longer a threat, it's an actual invasion. And we know this because of the Murdoch Press. <laughs> Murdoch Press was able to announce this week in a huge headline, they're here. The aliens are amongst us. And the aliens are amongst us because the Murdoch Press could even produce a photo to prove it. There they were, in a supermarket, in one of our supermarkets, and they were pushing one of our trolleys with our goods in them. And these, of course, were boat people. Now, I probably need to tell you how alarming this is. I mean, I mean, you've been told often enough over the last decade by various politicians and from both sides of politics that border security is an absolute must. And of course the politicians are quite right. Because once you start letting them in, once those boats start arriving, it's only a matter of time before the floodgates open and suddenly you're swamped. Your way of life is destroyed, your culture vanishes. And we know because it's happened. It happened in 1798. <laughs> and that I suspect that's one of the reasons why um, Australians are so vulnerable to this kind of scare campaign. We know it can happen, we know it did happen. Perhaps some of us at least feel a residual sense of guilt about it. But what we know is that if it happened once, it can happen again. And virtually from the time of settlement in Australia, that sort of fear, the fear that comes with a land girt by sea, the fear of that armada working off the coast, just ready to land and take us over. It's been very much part of the Australian psyche. And of course, Melbourne is um, a very good example of it. Uh, just down the road at Point Nepean, you have the gun emplacements which were put there to keep those bloody Russians out. I mean, okay, this was in the 1890s at the time of the Crimean War, but, but you don't, don't, don't leave it, just don't pretend that it's not still a threat. From then on, we've still had this constantly pointed at us. And this is really just about the only explanation I can come at to explain why an otherwise tolerant, easygoing, relaxed society gets so absolutely scared shitless the moment somebody raises this idea of border protection. Okay, now various politicians have exploited it in various ways. Um, quite obviously, during the Howard years, from the, time, the Tampa crisis, we had us thrown at us from all directions, and we were softened up for it. I mean, these are not merely boat people. They are not merely asylum seekers. They're not just coming looking for shelter. I mean, these could be all sorts of things. They're definitely huge uncles. We know that for a start, and we know how we Anglo-Saxons absolutely hate the idea of people who jump queues birds in front of us. And if they're not only huge uncles, I mean, they might be bearing diseases. I mean, God, some of them might be bringing colds, flu, measles, anything. And not only that, they could be trap smuggling drugs. I mean, you might think, looking at them, that they're, uh, they don't have to bring an awful lot of luggage, so they probably couldn't bring an awful lot of drugs, but you never know. I mean, that's what these people are like. They could be drug smugglers, and what's worse, of course, finally, they could be terrorists. Terrorists almost invariably arrive without any equipment at all after a very risky death to find a passage across a stormy ocean. <laughs> ready to reap their deadly aims upon us. So all of this was thrown at us over the time of the Howard government, but by particularly people like Philip Ruddy. And having been softened up, we were ready almost to believe it. And so when we saw these people clap behind razor wire, we knew it was pretty, yeah, perhaps okay. If they weren't criminals, they wouldn't be in jail, would they? 
I mean, that's how society works. If you're in jail, you're a criminal, by definition. And when even that became too difficult to sell, um, we decided just in case anybody realised that they were actually human beings after all, we'd get them way out of sight. Not just behind razor wire in the desert, we'd actually move them offshore. Um, we'd bribe the government of Nauru and the government of Papua New Guinea to take them away from us so no one could even think to visit them, look at them, hear what they had to say. And this was all accepted by the Australian people. It was not only accepted, it was applauded. Um, after the 2001 election, um, with that banner over every polling booth, we will decide who comes to this country in the circumstances in which they come. Voters were reported as leaving and saying, oh yeah, I voted for Johnny Coward because he knows how to deal with the towel heads, doesn't he? I mean, this was a, a, a genuine feeling among the Australian electorate. And of course, the Labor Party went to water. The Labor Party decided, after extensive polling and probably accurate polling, that it would be political suicide not to embrace this idea of border protection and of, in all its awfulness. Kim Beasley, to his credit, at least drew the line when Howard tried to introduce legislation which would have removed the offence of murder from the statute books if it was perpetrated by anyone in a uniform against an asylum seeker. Beasley had that much decency and was derided as a softy and a namby pamby and a milksop because of it. But apart from that, the Labor Party went along with it. And it was only many years later, in the dying days of the Howard government, that we actually got around to releasing children who were literally going insane to hold the razor wire. And that was only done under pressure from the Namby Pamby softies within the Liberal Party. It wasn't done under pressure by Labor. But nonetheless, we all felt with the change of government that things were going to get better, that surely we could now rely on the new Labor government to become more humane, more compassionate and just more bloody rational. I mean, that was really what we were asking for, for people, to be, for them to be more rational. We didn't think that Rudd should simply be a Ruddock dot. We thought that Rudd should be a Labor Prime Minister with Labor ideals. And to be fair, he started very well. Almost immediately, the Pacific solution, the hell holes in Nauru and in Manus Island and Papua New Guinea were closed down. The processing period was drastically shortened, so people weren't kept put on tent orbs for months any longer. Uh, a lot of people were released into the community rather than being kept in the camps. And most important of all, the horrible psychological torture of temporary protection protection visas was abolished. And this was one of the cruelest things the hard government did, that even after people were certified, accepted, stamped, pasteurised as genuine refugees, they were still only given temporary visas, which did not entitle them to any of the useful things that would have made them citizens of Australia, they couldn't, for instance, they were denied, for instance, even having English lessons. And most importantly, they were denied the right to leave the country to visit their families, let alone bring their families to Australia. If they left the country, they couldn't come back. So that was the Howard formula, and Rudd knocked it over, and we all applauded vigorously, as indeed he deserved. This, we thought, was the start of something new, something different, and a return to the kind of tolerant, easygoing, sensible, accepting Australia, which we all believed still existed in spite of the excesses of the hard years. But 
then something happened. Then the boats started arriving again. They'd largely stopped over the, during the hard years for all sorts of reasons, some of which were to do with the cruelty of the hard government, but some of which were simply the fact that the sources of supply were moving in other directions. And now, of course, we had a new source of supply with Sri Lanka. The Tamils, the war having finished, the Tamils were now fleeing persecution in their homelands and Australia was the obvious place to come via Indonesia. And so Rudd decided that something had to be done. The shock jocks were getting noisy again. The opposition was screaming about Rudd being soft on border protection, leaving our uh, coasts unguarded, the risk of being swamped, the floodgates being opened, all the usual bullshit. And Rudd, instead of trying to face it down and trading on the immense amount of goodwill that he still had at that stage, decided instead that he would find his own version of the Pacific solution in a kind of Indonesian solution, that we wouldn't actually send the, um, the asylum seekers, the boat people, to camps offshore we put them in camps offshore before they even bloody well got here. Um, we wouldn't leave them languishing in the camps in Indonesia, which not being a signatory to the United Nations Convention on Refugees, does not really give a shit about what happens to them when it's on their shores. So the camps weren't in Indonesia aren't much better than the camps in Nauru and Manus were but we were going to pay for them to be upgraded, we were going to make them nice and cheerful and, uh, you know, pot plants and maybe even cable television, we were going to make them really nice. So that was going to be all right, but what really mattered was keeping those bloody boat people out of sight. Yet again, we were going to duck shut the problem onto somebody else. And, of course, it all broke down. The Indonesians being a proud and sensible people and a lot more civilised now than perhaps we expected them to be, a lot, a lot kinder people and a lot um, more progressive a state than they were perhaps 20 years ago, simply said, no, we are not going to take um, people who are bound for Australia. We are not going to mop up your problems. They're your problems. We've got plenty of our own you bloody well solve them. And in spite of various farcical deals made with, for instance, the people on the Asiatic Viking who were promised all sorts of special treatment which Rudd um, slightly insanely refused to admit was special treatment, um, with the, the, the whole process eventually broke down. So the boats kept coming and the boats kept coming and then the rub suddenly up the ante. It is something that even Howard had never dared to do. Rudd declared that the boat people were a genuine threat to national security. The National Security Review was released in February and the government's response came with it. And part of the government's response was that Australia's spy agencies, ASIO, ASIS and the Defence Signals Division, were to start tracking refugees. Or well, we didn't of course call them refugees, we said they were to start tracking people smugglers, who were the evil ones. The refugees were all right, the people smugglers were the baddies. I mean this insane paradox that the service providers are uh, the most evil people in the world who should burn in hell forever while they sort of avail themselves of their services. Uh, innocent and wonderful people who should be well treated. I mean, this attitude goes back to the wars against prostitution, for Christ's sake. But um, anyway, Rudd decided to invoke it in this case. And so suddenly, the boat people, and the people bringing them to Australia and the organisations bringing them to Australia were placed on the same footing, if you like, as Al-Qaeda, 
and as Jamaa Islamia. They were two terrorist organisations. They were to be investigated by the agencies who investigated terrorists, not merely by the police who look after criminal matters. Now, you have to remember that this is a very clear and very important distinction within Australia, and it always has been. ASIO and ASIS, the intelligence organisations, were formed to detect deliberate threats to Australia. They are not criminal prosecutors, they are not police. They are specifically forbidden from investigating criminal matters. And if, in the course of their investigations into criminal matters, sorry, into matters properly belonging to the intelligence area, if in the course of those investigations they come across criminality, those organisations are specifically forbidden from informing the police forces. The division is clear and precise. It's been part of the Australian pattern since ASIO was put together in 1946. And Rudd suddenly changed it. Rudd turned the security organisations, which were supposed to be checking up, check, make, keeping Australia free from terrorism, subversion, foreign um, evil, foreign influence, etc. He turned them into a sort of quasi police force to use against people smugglers. Now, this was a revolution which, of course, the press on the whole missed completely. But one like of it were right. Greg Sheridan uh, in the Australian, Greg Sheridan said, Rudd deserved an A+. Plus. <laughs> now, Greg Sheridan has won goal at the Paralympics. And by Paralympics, I don't mean the Olympics for paraplegics. I mean the Olympics for paranoics. <laughs> Greg Sheridan is probably the most dedicated and zealous scaremonger that this country has ever seen. So if he gives Rudd an A+, plus, you've got to know that Rudd has done something truly terrible <laughs> and barely sane. But so it goes. And it hasn't really stopped. I mean, we still have uh, the government playing hardball. Um, now with Christmas Island overflowing, we have the refugees, the asylum seekers being brought to the mainland, and the ones who have been rejected, by golly, they're out, and they're out like, well, like Flynn was in, they're out. <laughs> um, so we heard um, in the Sydney Morning Herald just yesterday a headline which says, Rubs, how alive. Hard, that's hard line on asylum rejects. And the Prime Minister says his government makes no apology for deciding when to send rejected asylum seekers home. We will decide when these people are pissed off and we will determine the manner in which we piss them off. <laughs> it's not really very different, is it? Okay. Well, we still haven't got the proof the protect, um, temporary protection visas back. That's something to be devoutly thankful for. Um, the Pacific Island Council being closed down, that's something to be thankful for. And by and large, the asylum seekers are being processed faster and they're being treated better. That's also something to be very thankful for. But um, there's been no real attempt to change the politics of it. It's still absolutely essential for the government, for any politician, government or opposition, to be hard line on border protection. We have to safeguard our nation. That's what we're here for. And the fact that this handful of desperate, wretched people um, with no, um, they're stateless, most of them are panelists, they give all their money to the people smugglers, they have nowhere else to go. The idea that these people constitute a real and present threat 
for the security of what's probably the most stable democracy on the face of the earth is so silly that you can hardly believe it has legs. Yet, the Prime Minister refuses to try and put the opposite view. He will not try and turn the conversation, the political debate, back towards a more rational, sensible and obviously compassionate um, point of view. And so I think that on this issue, Kevin Rudd loses. I think on most things he's done pretty well. I think on many things the government certainly needs to be congratulated. And I find the alternative absolutely unthinkable. <laughs> but on this one, he loses and he should be condemned for it. Thank you.